Really lovely to see you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And, and I, I'll tell the viewers, I said to you off camera, what do you think is the most interesting thing we can talk about? And you said sanctions, and you said false narratives surrounding sanctions. So just, just tell our viewers what you believe is really going on at, at, compared with the narrative about sanctions hurting Europeans more uh, than the Russians potentially. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Good morning, Steve. Thank you very much for inviting me. Indeed, we are in Europe, and in Europe, the big false narrative that Putin's friends try to promote is that Europe is hurt by sanctions more than Putin's economy, and therefore sanctions are useless. Uh, Putin's friends cannot say war is good. They, they criticize Putin for the war, yet they try to stop the sanctions. Now, the narrative is false because Putin's economy is hurt. And when you actually look at the numbers, uh, say, second quarter GDP in Russia 2022 is 6% below first quarter. This is an amazing speed of uh, fall in GDP in annual terms that would be more than 20%. When you look at the decline in retail trade turnover, the consumption of goods and services by Russian households, that's about 10% decline. When you look at fiscal affairs, July had a deficit of something like 8% of GDP with oil prices at higher $100. That's never happened. So Putin is not doing very well, but what he's doing with his gas blackmailing uh, in July and August is trying to divide Europe to promote this false narrative to make sure that Europeans ahead of this difficult winter will stop uh, pushing the sanctions and the real sanctions will actually come into force only in December when oil embargo announced in Europe in May will take effect. OK, I'll, I'll challenge that from the words of a very senior politician I was speaking to yesterday who said, look, if you leave one bank able to trade with the West, then, hey, presto, all the money will gravitate through that bank. And there are porous uh, parts of these sanctions, left, right and centre, and that's why they're not effective at the moment, because the enforcement is very lax across Europe. How would you contend that? I, I would actually agree with that, and I think sanctions are not sufficiently strictly enforced. And indeed, any time politicians try to enforce sanctions further, there is this false narrative that circulates. But I actually agree there are, uh, there are uh, loopholes. And one of the things which hit Russia badly is the decline in imports. Governments imposed export re restrictions on what can be sold to Russia, technology, intermediate inputs, capital. And uh, many companies exited Russia. So imports of Russia, these are uh, now classified numbers. Russia stopped publishing trade statistics. But imports have collapsed by a factor of two, which hit Russian economy. And then in order to bring in stuff that Russia needs to keep producing, they use uh, those loopholes. They use banks, which are not sanctioned. They use intermediates and third parties, which are not sanctioned. So look, in another world, in another life, before you left Russia, what, 2013 was it you left? You were an advisor, a liberal advisor. You, like I, would have attended lots of space, international economic forums in St. Petersburg as well. And there were great hopes of reform in Russia, of transformation of Russia. There is a narrative now that Western leaders were working with him, but then Putin changed. Is that a false narrative or not, that Putin changed and actually they were right to engage with him, they were right to work with him? Because I don't know, the wars he was conducting in, in Chechnya and elsewhere, I don't know if Putin ever changed. Well, that's, uh, that's a great question. Uh, Putin has been building this system for 20 years. And initially, it looked like Russia could go either way. So I won't really criticize Western leaders for that. But indeed, uh, uh, we now observe that after 2014, Putin continued to build his war machine. And was not, there was no pushback, neither in 2008 nor in 2014. And if sanctions were stricter in 2014, probably we wouldn't be in this situation right now. We're talking about false narratives as well. And I think there's this other idea in the West, and which was dispelled to me by uh, the president of one of the big Baltic nations as well when I spoke to him. He said that the narrative is that if Putin were somehow to be deposed, we would have some liberal paradise or certainly a more liberal regime that the West can deal with again as well. That's not my understanding. My understanding is actually that if Putin goes, you're going to get a, a potentially another ultra-nationalist, and things could be just as tough, if not worse, for the relationship with the West. What do you think? Um, regimes like this 
change in a very unpredictable ways. It's very hard to uh, predict uh, what will come after Putin. So the reason, the reason for that is Putin has built this regime in a way nobody can replace him. In order to prevent uh, various conspiracies around him, coup d'etat, he built the regime in a way that without him the system will not function. People around him don't trust each other, sometimes hate each other. So if he's gone, the system will change somehow. So probably initially it will be some kind of uh, ultra-nationalist guy or military junta, uh, but it will not last for long exactly because the system is built around Putin. And eventually I think the system will collapse and there will be it, it could take uh, months, could be several years. Uh, it could be in North Korea on steroids, who knows? But it could also be a situation where the system collapses and somebody who wants to rebuild the economy reaches, us to, uh, reaches out to the West.